I'm and I'm telling you, you, I don't have five thousand dollars. Counts toilet roll papers. Clean your mask or go You're back to bed. Little... Hello, hello, my panda pals, and welcome back to my channel. Today, I'm going to be recapping what happened on season eight, episode three of Happily Ever After. Chapters will be in the description so that you can go ahead and skip any couple that makes you want to let your hair on fire. However, I do hope you will stick with me for the entire ride. If you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. It really does help the channel so much. With that said, let's get started. Sit down, buckle up, and let's go for a ride. Let's start things off with Kobe and Emily. Last episode, Kobe dresses Emily and her entire family up in traditional Cameroonian outfits in order to show his family that they have fully accepted his culture. A culture which they know absolutely nothing about. On their way over, the family observes a few things. Driving in this part of Cameroon is very different. There are no lanes, there are motorbikes with four people squished on top, there's a lot of yelling, honking, and general chaos, and also, there's no white people. Okay, I'm just gonna make one basic observation. Yeah? I have not seen one white person. <laughs> I have not seen one. Welcome to Cameroon. Kobe says that he loves Kansas, but he is so happy to be in a place where he does not stand out for the color of his skin. They continue to drive, and it's clear that Emily and her parents are growing more and more fearful about their safety. They've been told that things are unstable due to the Civil War, they pass a couple checkpoints where guards don't check everyone's passports, and they're told that they can't drive too close to the edge of the road because sometimes people are hiding in the bushes ready to jump out and rob you. Emily and her parents are a little freaked out, and that might not translate well if they act this way around my family. They arrive and oh my gosh, Kobe's family is huge. I was expecting immediate family, like mom, dad, brothers, and sisters, which even if it was just that, it would be pretty big because Kobe is one of 11 kids. But holy cow, they invited their entire bloodline. His family seems very warm and welcoming overall. They're super excited to see Kobe again, and everyone has this adorable moment of singing, dancing, and celebration. They all settle inside, and Kobe's father gives Emily's parents a plant in honor of his own father and mother as a sign of welcome. Kobe gets very emotional because he was so worried about his family was going to receive Emily and her kin. I'm so happy. Merci d'avoir pris mon enfant comme pour vous. Thank you for taking my son like your son. Kobe's father tells them that God brought everyone here so that they would be able to organize and participate in a traditional Cameroonian wedding. We're going to get married again. Because we didn't get married in a traditional way in Cameroon, my dad doesn't fully, you know, look at you as my wife. Emily and her parents are definitely surprised by this news and remind Kobe that they're only in Cameroon for a little bit and they really weren't expecting to have to plan anything, let alone a wedding. It's the next morning and Emily and her family talk to Kobe about the impromptu traditional wedding that's about to happen. Kobe tells them that this wedding is necessary because it's the only way that they're going to receive his ancestors' blessings. He goes ahead and walks them through what the wedding would look like. He says the day before the ceremony, he and his parents will come to their place and do something called a knock door, where they formally state that they are interested in their daughter. Okay. Well, we kind of know that you're married and have Exactly, but- It kind of bothers me that Emily and her family are making any amount of stink. They're not pushing back a lot, and they do say they're okay with going through with the wedding, but they keep saying small things like, we already know you're married, we had a wedding in America, you have kids together, which to me kind of signifies that they don't really see a point in doing this. And if that's the case, that's really rude. Cause if the tables were reversed and Emily and Kobe got married in a traditional Cameroonian wedding that they were not able to attend, they would 100% insist on having an American wedding when they come back to the States. Kobe goes on to say that Emily and her family will have to prepare food for them and their family is like, uh, okay, can we prepare American food? You guys have accepted the culture, so. Traditional dishes will be, you know, well appreciated. Kobe, these people know absolutely nothing about your culture. How are you going to expect them to learn how to make Cameroonian food for you? Kobe tells Emily's parents that they must also demand a dowry and make a list of things that they want as payment for giving up their daughter. Emily's mother is not a fan of this dowry situation at all. It feels to me like I am giving them my daughter in trade for goods. I do get where her mother is coming from because all she's hearing is, give me some goats and you can have my daughter. But traditionally, the concept of dowry is a lot deeper than that. 
The groom's kin understands that they are taking away the daughter from her family. That means that they lose her company as well as the potential contribution she would have made had she stayed. So the groom's family is basically providing monetary compensation for the loss the bride's family will incur, but it's also symbolic in showing the bride's kin that they are promising to take good care of their daughter. Because not only do they have the means, but they also have the willingness to meet all of their demands. Now, I understand that dowries can obviously be used to exploit women and children. I think Kobe's family is choosing to use it in the traditional way that it's actually supposed to be used. Emily is starting to stress out because there's suddenly a lot on her plate and her getting it right is incredibly important because she wants to show Kobe's family that she is a good wife by their standards. I cannot believe that they have been married for literal years and she never learned how to cook a single traditional Cameroonian dish. How are you gonna show his family that you accept their culture if you don't know anything about it? Also, you have two kids who are half Cameroonian. You don't want them to know where half of them comes from? You don't want to cook them dad's favorite meal from when he was a kid? That blows my mind, especially considering how proud Kobe is of his heritage. Moving on to Ed and Liz. Last episode, Liz and Ed work towards their realtor's license. Liz tells us that working with Ed should not be a problem because she is no longer his subordinate. And Ed tells us that he really needs this realtor thing to work out because they are starting to drown financially, a fact that he is trying to conceal from Liz in order to give her the wedding of her dreams. Liz and Riley are in the kitchen making breakfast pizzas and they're having a bunch of fun when Ed walks in and just kills the mood. You remember how to do the flour without making a mess? I love having Riley around, but I know I'm gonna have to mop the floor when we're done. Okay, and she is a kid cooking breakfast. Even if it was a grown ass adult, cooking is going to create some kind of mess. Here, you guys are making a mess. Baby, you need to just chill. You guys are such so messy. Baby, it's just a little here, bit move, right move, here. move, just move. Babe, there was no mess. Ed needs to calm his tatas down cause it is not like she is throwing eggs on the wall and making flower angels on the floor. It is literally a speck of flour on the kitchen counter and he's over here about to have an aneurysm. Liz calls Ed out on his BS by going over to the stove to point out the mess that's under the burner grate from when Ed made pasta and failed to clean up after himself. Being a little brat. Clean your mask or go You're back to bed. Brat. You're gonna be a little brat. Guys, just start talking about it and we can clean up everything after we're done. <laughs> Dude, kudos to Riley for interjecting with a solution that not only makes sense, but also diffused the tension. But damn, that sucks that y'all are putting a 10 year old child in a position to have to regulate your adult ass emotions. Liz tells us that Ed and her have a lot of work to do with how they communicate. No duh and that things are really stressful with the wedding coming up and them not having jobs. Are you ready to say you're sorry? Are you ready to clean your stove? Yes. Thank you. Is that how they settled the argument? Guys, that is not how you do it. Oh, are you ready to say sorry? I don't know, dude. Are you ready for me to stick this rolling pin so far up your ass you taste maple for a week? The wedding is coming in eight weeks and Liz's mother and grandmother come into town to go dress shopping with her and Riley. Liz says she's a very stingy shopper, so she's okay with just looking today and not purchasing despite her wedding being only two months away. My mom is not a big fan of Ed. She doesn't like the way Ed's treated me. I need my family to see what I see in Ed. Liz's mom says she's still on the fence because her daughter deserves to be happy. Her grandmother says she's fine as long as the two are communicating, which, they are doing poorly. Liz comes out in the first dress and I think the dress is beautiful and she looks so stunning in it. I'm shocked that this wedding's actually happening. <laughs> so are we. <laughs> Liz's mother says she wants to talk to Ed before the wedding day and try to work out the discomfort that hangs between them. Liz is super hesitant about this idea because she thinks this will only cause them to backtrack. I just like when you guys talk, I don't want, I don't, I don't want you to be like too straightforward because I give that to him enough. Liz comes out in a lacy fitted dress, which I personally did not like. I don't really like figure fitted wedding dresses, uh, but it's not my wedding and Liz loves it. So that's really all that matters. Liz is ready to pull the trigger until she hears the price. So after tax will be 8 dollars 45 Is this more than you want, but only a little? Just 
take it. Okay. I have been watching way too much Say Yes to the Dress because when they said that that dress was $800, I was like, damn, that is a steal. Only $800? You snatch that right up, honey. Liz ends up biting the bullet and makes the purchase. She leaves nervous for tomorrow's 4th of July party because it is imperative that Ed makes a good impression and shows her family that he has changed. Now onto Rob and Sophie. Last episode, Sophie told Claire that she's gonna meet up with Rob so that they can talk things through. And by talk things through, I mean, she's gonna tell Rob for the 5,000th time that he needs to change everything about himself in order to get her to trust him again. Sophie heads back to the apartment and tells us that she's a little nervous because she hasn't been home in over two months and their last tiff ended pretty badly. I don't want us to just be separated forever. I do wanna be with Rob and live with him. Uh, are you sure about that? Cause you can't really say that you wanna be with him when your biggest complaint is that he needs to change in order for you to be with him. Sophie heads in and Rob points out some flowers on a table nearby that he got for her. I had to stop mid-traffic, jumped out in the rain, stole them off of somebody's bush. Be careful, there's a lot of thorns on that. <laughs> Rob, work smarter, not harder. They sell pink roses at the grocery store. They even dethorn them for you. So you don't have to go around stealing flowers out of someone else's yard and you don't have to cut up your wife's fingers. It's a win-win. Why would you do it the way that you did it? What is this? That's just a list of things I think would be very helpful from you to help us cohabitate. Oh, poor Sophie. She thought it was gonna be a letter, but instead it is just a bunch of nitpicky bullshit. Washing off dishes before putting in the sink. Putting dirty clothes in bin. Don't get mad at me when you don't get what you want. Remember that we're trying to move forward. I do agree with the move forward and don't focus on the past, but by preceding it with nitpicky requests, like wash the dishes before you put them in the sink, you turned the entire thing into a joke. Like now it's just a petty retort instead of a genuine call to try and work things out. Sophie looks really hurt and she asks him what the point of this list is when their relationship issues have nothing to do with these small scale personal quirks. She tells him she left because she basically keeps finding proof that he's being dishonest to her. I'm literally just trying to find ways for us to have less issues. Why can't you just clarify for me what I can do? Sophie tells him to stop online cheating and to stop trying to control her. Rob asks her what the heck she means by controlling her and apparently, he counts the rolls of toilet paper that she goes through. Because you literally use a whole roll of Okay, I'm a, a woman. Women use more toilet paper than men. Who counts toilet roll papers of people using Who it? Who uses That's a weird. whole roll of toilet paper in a day? I agree that women use more toilet paper than men. I mean, we get our moon days. We can't shake a ding-a-ling after we pee. But holy crap, I don't think I've ever used an entire roll in a day. And I am very lactose intolerant, living like I'm super tolerant. You'll literally sit in the bathroom and just hang out in the bathroom for hours. So you doing this okay. for hours? Oh, Sophie, fiber, please. You have issues. I think what will fix a marriage is you get some therapy. Ma'am. Yes, Rob needs therapy. He has a lot of issues with his self-confidence and having it manifest in incredibly hurtful and destructive ways, but you do too. You have a lot of trauma to work through. Addict mother, identity crisis, gaslighting and cheating boyfriend. It is not just him. Rob tells her that he is and has always been willing to do whatever she wants him to do for her to feel comfortable with him. Sophie tells him that she isn't gonna stay over today because she feels like all they're gonna do is just fight. Okay, I'm sorry that I made a list, but stay over. It takes one thing for one of us really to start arguing. about to stay over? Sophie gives him a hug and leaves the apartment, once again, not having clarified to Rob any real ways for him to help her feel more secure in the relationship. Rob learns from his mistakes and goes out to buy a rose from the store. He tells us that he's gonna change tactics a bit and try to get Sophie to come back. She's dying to get me to do soft, sweet things. So tonight we're gonna go on a date and hopefully it wins her over a little bit. I like that him changing tactics was just being more thoughtful and romantic. He just has to be sweet once in a blue moon. And the worst part is that Sophie falls for it every single time. Sophie arrives and he sits her down. I have something else I wanted to read to you. It's a poem. You deserve love every single day. 
in every little and big way. So here's my vow that I'll keep to. I'll do my part in loving you. Let me give you the love you deserve. Let me in and let love preserve. Together we'll make a lifetime of memories and build this road to endless possibilities. I think he meant to say, let love persevere, but that's fine, it's Rob. Sophie falls back in love again at this little crumb of affection. It's just really sweet and he's never done anything like this for me before. If it continues like this, I will move home. We can start to do more things like this as a couple. And then the two head in to learn how to two-step. They seem to be having a good time goofing off when Sophie stops him to tell him that her good friend Callum from England is visiting them tomorrow and she wants to introduce them to each other. Rob, super not happy about this. He starts to pout like a baby and he says, well, I don't really have a choice, do I? And she tells him to be nice. I'm a nice guy. It's debatable. Who thinks I'm not a nice guy? Me. Besides my you. My mom, my friends, everyone that I know. Rob starts to get super insecure and super suspicious because what guy who is just a friend flies across the ocean to visit a girl? Uh, a lot of people, Rob. A lot of people. I understand that the concept of a male-female platonic relationship is very hard to wrap your head around because every girl you talk to, you talk to because you want to bang them. But a lot of people are capable of having platonic male-female relationships, and they do. Moving on to Ashley and Manuel. Last episode, Ashley tells Manuel that she cannot brush off the secrecy shrouding his life anymore, and Manuel tells her that this is his life, so she needs to stay out of it. Ashley decides to take a step back from trying to force her way into his life and instead tries to buy his trust. So the two are headed out today to buy Manuel a new motorcycle. He had one in Ecuador, he always talks about it, and he thinks that having one in the States will be a good way for him to get out and make some new friends. He says that life in Rochester has been pretty hard, his English hasn't been improving, and he kind of just sits at home waiting for his green card. I'm assuming he's saying that if he had his green card, he could go out and work where he could make friends and his English would conversationally improve. Stop being so dramatic, Manuel. <sighs> Manuel hops on a bike at the store and the sales associate says this would be perfect for going back and forth to see his family in New York. That surprised me a little bit that Manuel had a lot of family. I didn't realize there was as much as there is. The associate shows them a motorcycle that also has a space for a passenger to sit comfortably behind him and Manuel is not about that life. Ashley is not super keen on the fact that Manuel wants this purchase to only be for him and not include her at all. Females look at everything with eyes of romance, and guys look at it as, I'm married, but I'm still gonna have my adventure. Sir, do not pigeonhole this into some stupid gender stereotype bullshit. Ashley is not looking at this relationship through the eyes of romance. She's being very practical and is trying to find a way to get her husband to trust her enough to open up to her about his family. And sure, Manuel is married and may want his own adventure, but again, Manuel is not working. Ashley is paying for everything and he criticizes her for buying a $5 coffee, thus not having enough money to send home to his family. But buying a bike that costs thousands of dollars? Sure, he can justify that. He doesn't complain about Ashley dropping money on this. The two leave the shop in a tiff and Ashley says she needs more time to talk about this and Manuel just shuts her down. Fed up with their lack of communication, Ashley takes Manuel to go get a spiritual bath. She tells the spiritualist that Manuel has issues with communication, not only because he doesn't know English, but also because he's unable to open up about his life. The spiritualist asks Manuel for consent with taking a spiritual bath and some herbs to open up his ability to speak English. And I am over here like, uh, you can do that? I mean, I don't think it's gonna work, but God, if I could get one for like, Korean, Spanish, Japanese, Chinese, French, Russian. Could I have one of each, please? <laughs> Do you give out bundle deals? Manuel says he tries his best to support Ashley and her witchcraft, but he does not believe in it because he's Catholic. He says he's fine with her practicing as long as it does not involve him. Sin ofender. Um, pero no crees que está siendo un poco cerrado de la mente? ¿De ese baño de, de qué consiste? A ver. Manuel agrees and Ashley pulls him aside to clarify that the reason for their visit to the store is because she wants him to let her be a part of his family's life and to open up to her. He has family in New York that she knows nothing about and she wants to fit into his life more. Manuel is a little bit hesitant at first, but he does finally say that if she's ready to meet his family, then he will go ahead and make the introduction. Pero que ella al conocer a mi familia en Nueva York se calme un poco. 
quita esa desconfianza que ella tiene y comienza a trabajar. Manuel tells us that things with his family are complicated, so in order to show that he is making an effort to communicate with her better, he signs up for a community English class, and it does not go well. Chicken rice. Learn to say the whole thing. Can I please have the... Chicken con rice. Say it in the sentence that, that we have in front of you here. To be fair, I do think Manuel is in a class that is way too advanced for him. Why are we in a class teaching conversational English phrases? Maybe we should start him off with the alphabet. Manuel gets home where Ashley is getting his spiritual bath ready, and Manuel tells us that he was hoping he did not have to do this after agreeing to introduce her to his family, but here we are. They go outside to their walnut tree in the backyard to perform the bath. Black walnut kills everything around it. I want that tree to just suck up any energy that we no longer want. Ashley rinses Manuel with cold ass herbal water as she tells him that it's important that he integrate her into his life more. She asks him what his honest opinion is when it comes to how his family will receive her. Manuel tells her that they are devout Catholics and he's worried how they're gonna receive the news of her witchcraft. He suggests instead that she tell them that she work at the gym as a spin instructor and leave her witchcraft out of it. Moving on to Nicole and Mahmoud. Last episode, Mahmoud moved into Nicole's sin infested apartment. He's being super grouchy and super grumpy, and Nicole gets very upset that he is not more excited to see her, especially considering that this is their last shot at making their marriage work because she is not moving back to Egypt ever. It's a new day and Nicole brings Mahmoud some donuts to start his day off. He tells her that he has no idea how she eats this kind of stuff. I love mashi. I love kosheri. <laughs> you make me miss now. I mean, you are in LA. You can just go out and find Egyptian food. It's there. You can also make mashi and koshari at home. I looked up recipes. Mashi is rice stuffed in veggies and koshari is like pasta, lentils, and chickpeas. I mean, mama didn't make it, so of course it's not gonna taste as good, but you're not completely out of luck here. It was so good, like when I woke up and opened my eyes and I found Nicole there. I love it, that. I just do not believe that that was a sincere thought that inhabited his brain this morning. Nicole takes Mahmoud out to Santa Monica Pier for the day, and she tells him that if there's anything that she can do to make his experience in the States better, please let her know because she knows what it feels like to be in his position. Nicole tells us that she knows he's tired and homesick, but she wants him to have a little fun today. She can see Mahmoud is being pouty, so she asks why, and he says that he's just homesick and misses his family. Nicole says that he needs to open up and talk to her more because there might be something she can do to help, and he goes on to say, everything's fine, it's just gonna take some time to adjust. Barely smiled today at all. So. <laughs> I am like, and I just don't wanna be this to be an experience where you just are unhappy and... Mahmoud reassures her by saying, I'm happy I'm here with you. I'm happy, I swear. But he's got like the most unenthused, farthest thing from happy face. They pass by a woman wearing a purple hijab. Stop dead in your tracks to f*** there. I stopped you. what? You know what, like if you want an Arab woman, you should go get one. Like why I'm here now. And Nicole tells us that this definitely triggered some insecurities inside of her, as if she isn't good enough or Muslim enough for Mahmoud. I'm putting your ass back on the plane, you go back to Egypt. If you want to be a little womanizer, you can go back to Egypt. Okay, f I, I will, but I'm done. Moving on to Gino and Jasmine. Last episode, Gino and Jasmine have a consultation with an immigration lawyer who informs Gino that his prestigious degree from Google University has unsurprisingly failed him. Now, instead of getting her kids into the States within six months, it could take upwards of two years and it will not come cheap. Jasmine is absolutely distraught and Gino tries to console her saying that two years is the worst case scenario. It could have been avoided if we have had an attorney up for us. You missed yeah, one. that thing. Jasmine tells him that she does not want him to deal with the process of her green card or her children's visas because he's just gonna screw those up too. You you screw my life. We are hiring a lawyer. I busted my ass to get you to this country. Jasmine says that hiring a lawyer for this is not gonna cost a fortune. And Gino tells her it's still money he does not have and that the time for immigration visas to get approved will stay the same no matter who files the paperwork. Not really. A lawyer is going to make sure you have all of the documents and that they are all filled out properly, which you did not do the first time, so... Jasmine begs Gino to hire a lawyer and he stands firm saying that he cannot afford it. 
Jasmine continues to cry and cry and she just stares at Gino like she's trying to Jedi mind trick him into telling her what she wants to hear. Gino tells us that he does feel bad about his mistake, but the blame lies with both of them and that they both need to move forward the best that they can. Jasmine says that when it comes to her kids, that there is no amount of money that is too much. What kind of evil person you are? No, I'm not evil. I'm begging you. I'm and begging I'm telling you. you, I don't have five thousand dollars. Jasmine says that they are not on the same page and she doesn't know if their marriage can survive this. I am not a mom and this might be a hot take, but her kids are with her mom and her sister. They are safe, they are being well taken care of, and I know it sucks, but it is what it is. If Jasmine really wanted Gino to hire a lawyer, then she should have taken the $4,000 he gave her and hired a lawyer. But she prioritized getting butt implants. She prioritized having him pay for her fantasy wedding. If you wanted to get your kids here, you would have done it by now. You don't give a oh, about me. You screwed up in your dumb head. Wow. I wanna get divorced from you. I don't wanna yeah. be married to you. And that, my panda pals, is all for today. If you like my content and you wanna support the channel, be sure to hit that subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. It really does help the channel a whole bunch. I hope you all had a great time. Be sure to join me next time to find out how jealous Rob gets after meeting Callum and whether or not Ashley bursts into flames after stepping foot inside a Catholic church. And as always, thanks for not letting me ride this train wreck alone. Bye.